This video will focus on sport and politics. You can see if we look at the syllabus that there is a dedicated dash point to sport and politics. And specifically, we're identifying instances when Australia has used sport for political purposes, and we're evaluating the impact of this on the athletes and the Australian public. So our critical questions identify instances, so examples when Australia has used sport for political purposes, and of course, evaluating the impact of this on the athletes and the Australian public. And we will look at Moscow, the Moscow Olympics, and of course, the apartheid boycotts. First up, we'll take a look at political leaders and how they might use sport to enhance their connection with the public and to build culture and belonging in the society and also to help shape our national identity. Political leaders usually connect with sport through having a favourite team that they support. They do place great emphasis on sport and they usually attend big events to present trophies and awards and things like that. So our political leaders of the past and present celebrate sport and often to build a shared sense of national belonging amongst the population and a sense of tribalism through national identity. They attend big sporting events to present trophies and awards and we've seen this over the years from all prime ministers of all political persuasions. Uh, they generally support a particular team and they're quite parochial about that. They're not afraid to put on the colours and wear the jerseys, and they use this to connect with the people. They also use it to promote national identity and use the national teams of Australia to generate the support amongst the community and that sense of we're all in it together and we all should support our national team because if we do well on the national stage, then that's good for the nation. Political leaders attend the Olympics to support our athletes, to emphasise the importance of certain sporting events. And they're always there to welcome home our Olympic athletes, to showcase that sense of heroism that our athletes portray when they're participating on the national international stage. Political leaders often connect with sports to announce new policies or make decisions about funding, and this can often reflect their values. Politicians also make funding commitments for large events, and you can see here Australia's bid for the Football World Cup, which was made in 2010 for the 2022 World Cup. Uh, and political leaders of both persuasions were very supportive of this because they could see the potential economic benefits and also the benefits for our national identity. Sport is often symbolised in the Prime Minister's office and you can often see images and uh, gifts that they may have received in the past, often on display in the Prime Minister's office, just to show the importance of sport in their everyday role. Now, of course, the government has appointed a Minister for Sport. Okay, So the Australian government shows the importance of sport in Australia's culture and society by allocating a dedicated minister and, of course, government funding to promote healthy behaviours, participation, economic activity and, of course, promote Australia's national identity. And this is, this is done so to try to achieve international excellence and success. Historically, sport and politics has intertwined or been linked and this has been the case internationally. We've talked a little bit about nationalism and that identification with one's own nation and support for its interest, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. And we saw an extreme nationalism at play through history, particularly in Berlin in 1936, with Hitler using the 1936 Berlin Olympics to display the superiority of the Aryan race. We also saw this extreme or intense nationalism on display through some of the Olympic events over the years, in particular Moscow in 1980 and, of course, Los Angeles in 1984. Athletes were used as a means of demonstrating the political might of the American-led Olympic boycott in 1980, and this was the case also for the Soviet-led boycott in 1984. So in Moscow, we had the Americans deciding not to attend in protest over the Soviet Union's actions or invasion of Afghanistan. 
And we had the Soviets do the same thing four years later with the Olympic boycott in Los Angeles. And so we saw during the Cold War both nations using the Olympics to push their own interests uh, to the detriment of other nations in what was called a, a pseudo war between the US and the Soviet Union. Now we'll look at some case studies where sport has been used specifically for political purposes. And we'll talk about Australia's involvement in these instances. And the first is the Moscow Olympic boycott in 1980. So the Moscow Olympics were held in 1980. And of course, in late December in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and this outraged the United States of America. In response to this, the USA President Jimmy Carter ordered a boycott of the 1980 Moscow game. So a boycott just means that he was not wanting the American athletes to attend the Olympics in Moscow as a protest. He encouraged the US allies, including Australia, to follow. US President Jimmy Carter put pressure on Prime Minister of Australia Malcolm Fraser to follow and boycott as well. Malcolm Fraser then put pressure on Australian athletes and their organisations, especially the Australian Olympic Federation. And he even offered cash payments of $6,000 for those who supported the Moscow boycott. In May, the Australian Olympic Federation voted narrowly to defy the government and voted to send a team to Moscow. And whilst Australia still sent a team, it was considerably smaller than the previous Olympics. And athletes marched under the Olympic flag as opposed to the Australian flag in protest. Whilst this decision appeared to be a good one for the athletes, it still placed plenty of pressure on the athletes to make a decision, given that the Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Fraser, was encouraging them not to attend. Athletes faced intense pressure from the national government and many sporting administrators and commentators to boycott the Games. And this led to a divided nation. In society, there were many protests and disgruntled fans who thought that Olympic sport and politics should not be mixed. An athlete who experienced this intense pressure was Raylene Boyle, a very successful 100 metre and 200 metre sprinter. She was one of the athletes who was targeted by the government and received a $6,000 payment to boycott. Interestingly, Raylene Boyle, who won plenty of Commonwealth Games medals, was unable to win an Olympic gold medal. One could argue that this boycott prevented her from achieving her goals. You can see this article outlines just how Raylene Boyle felt. She felt crushed. She felt emotionally destroyed and confused about the decision that she had to make. Similarly, Tracy Wickham, who was a champion swimmer and just 17 at the time, was pressured by the government to boycott. Unfortunately, it was up to young athletes like Tracy Wickham, to deal with the negative public outcry of the boycott. And this certainly affected her socially and emotionally. And it's also interesting that Tracy Wickham was unable to win an Olympic gold medal in her career. So you could argue that this event had a big impact on her career and also affected how she was viewed by the Australian public. Now we'll look at the apartheid boycotts. Apartheid was a system of racial segregation enforced through legislation by the National Party governments, which ruled between 1948 and 1994 in South Africa. South Africa under apartheid was subject to a variety of international boycotts in all areas, and that extended to sport. There was some debate about whether the aim of the boycott for sport was to end segregation in sport or to end apartheid altogether. As part of this boycott, South Africa was expelled from competing at the Olympics from 1964 to 1988. Australia boycotted competition with South African national teams in cricket and rugby union, among others. An athlete hugely affected by this was Australian Indigenous rugby player Lloyd McDermott, who refused to tour South Africa with the Australian rugby team in 1963. Unfortunately, following this, he was unable to represent Australia in rugby again. And some players in Australia's cricket team organised what were called rebel tours at the time. And these tours were unsanctioned and not supported by the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister labelled these players as traitors, 
for touring South Africa at the time. So you can see the impact on the athletes in this case, but also the Australian public were very much divided about the boycott as well. Now we'll look at the case of Peter Norman. Peter Norman was an Australian sprinter who represented the nation in the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games. He actually won the silver medal in the 200 metres. Peter Norman stood beside his fellow African-American sprinters and supported their cause, which was the Black Power Salute and their stance against racism in the United States. Peter Norman stood next to them and wore an Olympic Project for Human Rights badge. Unfortunately, Norman faced criticism for his stance in Australia and it effectively ended his career, a reflection of race relations in Australia at the time and also the fact that Australia was a strong ally of the United States and it did cause some controversy between the nations. In 1972, Peter Norman was overlooked for the Munich Olympic Games. In 2012, he finally received an apology from the government and you can see that a statue has been erected in Melbourne in his honour. It's time to think about these critical questions. Identify instances when Australia has used sport for political purposes and of course evaluating the impact of this on athletes and the Australian public with specific reference to examples like Moscow and the apartheid boycotts. And some ideas that you could think about for the evaluate question include that athletes and sports were, were used as a political tool. So you need to think about who wins and loses from this because athletes generally will miss out on national and international representation if they do decide to boycott and support a political cause. And of course the Olympics and World Cups only occur every four years so of course this can affect their potential and their career. Of course confusion and emotional stress for athletes can occur due to the pressure placed on them by the government and we saw this with the example of Raylene Boyle of course, judgment of athletes by the public for their decisions. There was huge judgment cast upon young athletes like Tracy Wickham at the time. And of course, that affects the athletes uh, emotionally and socially. It can also affect athlete training, skill development and the opportunity to represent. And we saw this with both apartheid and Moscow with athletes not able to, for example, tour and play against perhaps the best athletes in the world. The public may not get the chance to view competition at international level if boycotts occur and, and obviously the public would have liked to have seen Australia's best athletes attend Moscow or Australia's best rugby players play against the best South African players and so it can affect the public's connection with sport and of course athletes are disadvantaged if they take this stance both through their sport and potentially economically. Peter Norman was not recognised for his silver medal at the 1968 Olympics, so you can see that recognition can be an issue. Certain sports may receive special treatment from government and leaders, and we saw that through how Prime Ministers can support certain causes over others. And of course, sport can take higher importance in some case than other issues in our society. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation.